joining Fort Collins Christian Church. It's great to be together with you this morning. Uh, we're going to have a Bible study before we take the Lord's Supper in a little bit. Uh, this morning we're continuing our study through the letter known as 1 Peter with our theme from that letter of being refined by fire. But before we head over there, I actually want to start off this morning in the ministry of Jesus by looking at a section of scripture in Luke chapter 9. So please join me there as we start off. Luke chapter 9 verses 18 through 23. It says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Here we see here in this passage, Jesus asked this transcendent question. Who do people say that I am? And of course, Peter gets it right when he says, you are the Messiah or you are the Christ. And of course, Jesus goes on to explain that, yeah, you're right. And what this means is that he was going to suffer and give his life for us on the cross by being the Messiah. And he also says he's going to be raised from the dead. That's pretty amazing. But then Jesus proceeds to tell us that anyone who wants to follow him, it's going to mean denying ourselves. It's going to mean taking up our cross daily. And by Jesus saying daily here, he's not referring to how we die. He's referring to how we are to live each day and that way is in the way of the cross. You know, we started looking at this last week in 1 Peter chapters 2 and 3. And I told you that we were going to continue on that theme today. So the title of today's lesson is the same as it was last week. The way of the cross just continued. You know, for those who were not with us last week, I know specifically it's great to have Cheyenne joining us this morning. I'm going to give a very brief recap of what we looked at last week in the first part of the way of the cross. You know, in 1 Peter, the Holy Spirit instructs us in some very practical ways to live in day-to-day -day life in the way of the cross. You know, in 1 Peter, we are given instruction on how we interact with the world in chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. You know, we're given specific instruction on how we interact in the home, specifically husbands and wives, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And then thirdly in this section, he gives us practicals on how to interact in the church in chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. In other words, we're seeing how to interact with people we come across in day-to-day -day life. Of course, last week we looked at the first two of these, in the world and in the home. You know, with the world, the Holy Spirit gives instruction through Peter about how we are to deal with authority, specifically when there's injustice. And how we do that is by entrusting ourselves to him who judges justly, just like Jesus did at the cross. You know, within the home, the Holy Spirit through Peter gives instruction to husbands and to wives to relate to each other with submission and with consideration for each other's needs, just like Jesus did for us, his bride, the way of the cross. You know, for a thorough study on those two areas in the home and in the world, you can go listen to it last week online. I'm not going to rehash all the details here this morning, but today, as I promised last week, we will cover the third area, and that's the way of the cross in the church. Before we do that, though, I want to reiterate what we talked about last week, that these instructions are framed around the message of what Jesus did for us. 
See, we're not to strive for things like selflessness or humility simply because they are virtuous traits, but because we strive to follow our Lord and he was selfless, he was humble. You know, we understand our need for his grace when we fall short. You know, we understand the reality of his love which compels us to try to live this way. And we also understand our reliance on his power to mold and to change us to be more like him as we navigate circumstances that test us and refine us. You know, it's all too possible to emphasize a spiritual truth or virtue or gift, but miss Jesus and miss our need for him. See, Christian, Christianity is not simply an ideology or a type of morality or social ethic or even worldview. Christianity is the good news that truth, that sacrificial love, that goodness are found in deity who became a person, Jesus. You know, let's look again at how the Holy Spirit frames these practical instructions in 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 25. It says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We're called to follow Jesus's example in this because he suffered for us on the cross. He bore our sins on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. These instructions on how to live are all in light of that reality. You know, in relationships, even in the church, we can suffer. So Jesus' example in the face of suffering is paramount for us. He suffered unjustly, we're told here. I mean, he didn't deserve what he suffered. He suffered without striking back. We're told that he suffered patiently. And he did that by entrusting himself to God. And we're told that he suffered sacrificially. In other words, for the benefit of others. Jesus was able to do this because he entrusted himself to God who judges justly. You know, when we face challenges, the very core of how we view God is challenged. Do we believe he is just? Do we believe he is good? And why did Jesus do this? Well, verse 25 tells us because we had gone astray and we needed our souls and still need our souls shepherded and overseen back into the grace of God. The way of the cross is obviously a way of suffering, a way of sacrifice, a way of self-denial. But in Jesus's example, we also see that the way of the cross is a way of trust. It's a way of surrender. It's a way of humility toward the one who has shepherded us and restored us. You know, verse 21 tells us, to this you were called. To what? Well, to the instructions that he had just given about our interactions in the world, to the instructions he was about to give about our interactions in the home, and finally, our interaction with each other in the church. Let's go ahead and jump to that third point, relationships in the church, the way of the cross in the church, and let's read 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
No, he says, finally, all of you. And this is as he's addressing the church. He says, all of you to this you were called, in verse 9, again, to this way of the cross with each other you are called. You know, let's break down each of these instructions that are given in our relationships with each other in the body of Christ. And as we do it, we're going to highlight some examples from Jesus for each one. You know, obviously, we're going to be pretty brief as we cover these this morning. But these are definitely worth deeper study and application on your own. So I encourage you to do that. But the first one mentioned here is to be like-minded, or some versions will say live in harmony. You know, this speaks of a unity of the Spirit, in which powerful tensions are held together by overriding loyalty to Jesus. You know, there are a lot of things outside of Scripture that we can differ on as followers of Jesus I'm not going to get into specific areas that I'm speaking of, but we can easily get caught up in silly arguments over things that don't matter in eternity. You know, the thing at issue here, rather than me picking specific areas, is that we can be so prideful and selfish with each other, forgetting that there is a greater cause we are called to. Satan loves it. When we're divided by sin. I mean, Ephesians 4, 2 says that this unity of the Spirit is so important that we should make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, a unity that the Spirit already establishes in us. You know, let's look at an example of Jesus here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It reads, Therefore, if you, as followers of Jesus, have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You know, the emphasis there is pretty self-explanatory as we read through it, the humility, the considering others above ourselves, the like-mindedness in Christ. He says, have the same mindset of Christ in your relationships. You know, the second one mentioned in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12 is to be sympathetic. You know, sympathy and selfishness cannot coexist. I mean, sympathy depends on the willingness to forget self and to put ourselves in each other's shoes, to experience the sorrows and the joys of each other. I mean, the word in the Greek literally means to step in others' shoes to share sentiment. You know, our woke culture discredits sympathy. But let's look at how Jesus himself is described in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. It says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus is sympathetic, and he's sympathetic because he became human to know what we go through. I mean, Jesus literally came to earth and stepped in our shoes to face what we face. You know, we're to follow his example because to this you were called. You know, the third area that 1 Peter 3 speaks of in our interactions with each other in the church is to love one another. And this is repeating Jesus' famous teaching in John 13, 34, and 35. Let's go ahead and look at that. Jesus told his disciples, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Get the point? 
love one another, Jesus said. And he says, as I have loved you, again, to his example, we are called. Now, we could define as I have loved you, speaking of Jesus, with many different adjectives. But at the core of Jesus' love for us is sacrifice. In other words, the way of the cross. You know, without this type of love Jesus speaks of in John 13, he says we won't even identify as his disciples. You know, this might be looking to meet a brother and sister's needs. You know, not complaining that no one's meeting my needs. Although, to note, humbly, we are vulnerable with our own needs, and if we're each looking to meet each other's needs, our, our needs will be met. But, but it's a spirit that says, I want to meet my brothers and sisters' needs, not everyone. What about me? You know, we've got to ask ourselves, am, am I critical? Am I indifferent? Am I protective of my time and space? Or am I sacrificial? Putting myself out there to be used by God as a servant to my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, when we're around each other, we should expect that God is going to use us as, in, in some way, like when we're around each other, God's going to use me to admonish or to encourage or to serve one another. You know, next week, John McDonald is going to be preaching the word for us, and he's going to be looking at the Danite tribe of Israel as an example of the danger we put ourselves in spiritually when we ignore or neglect this call to love one another as God's people. I know I'm looking forward to hearing that lesson from John next week, and I hope you are too. You know, the next area of 1 Peter 3 tells us in our relationships with each other, the way of the cross is to be compassionate. You know, again, this word literally means to be moved in our bowels. You know, we see many occasions in Scripture where Jesus showed compassion when no one else did. When I think of the adulterous woman in John chapter 8 where everyone wanted to stone her and Jesus showed compassion. He still called her to repent, but showed compassion. I think of Luke 19 with Zacchaeus where everyone was criticizing him as a tax collector. What do you want? And Jesus like, I I'm going to go have a meal with you at your house. Jesus showed compassion when no one else did. You know, I want to look at this passage in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 uh, and 41. It says, And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And look at this. Moved with compassion. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Touched him. Touched a leper. Someone no one touched. His compassion caused him to stretch out his hand and touch him and say, I am willing be cleansed. Compassion moved Jesus to help this leper, to touch this leper. You know, we see so much evil in the world around us, that it's easy to become hardened to needs. And we've got to pray. We, we've got to fight in prayer to stay in step with the Spirit so that this hardening of our hearts does not happen to us. It really is only through the Spirit of Christ that we can maintain a soft and compassionate heart in the face of evil. You know, the next thing 1 Peter 3 told us in these relationships, the way of the cross, is to be humble. You know, no one is better than the person next to us if we're at the foot of the cross. I mean, at the foot of the cross, what could any of us possibly have to be proud of? Therefore, openness and vulnerability is a sign of humility. You know, do we open up our lives and allow others to walk alongside us to help us spiritually, even to challenge us at times spiritually? Independence is usually pride. When we speak of the body of Christ within a body, independent cells are, are cancerous cells. Defensiveness is usually pride, and we battle with these things. 
And yet we see Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 and 39. It says, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And here we see the vulnerability of Jesus. We see him open, yes, with God about his heart, but he's also open with his bros there that were with him. Humility, vulnerability, these are the way of the cross. You know, the next thing that section in 1 Peter 3 tells us is, do not repay evil for evil, but rather repay evil with blessing. I mean, remember the context of 1 Peter. Our brothers and sisters who were the original recipients of this letter were facing tremendous, extreme mistreatment, being blamed for the fire in Rome by Nero when they had absolutely nothing to do with it. And the temptation had to be to hate back, had to be to retaliate. You know, most of us have been mistreated. We've been hurt in relationships. We know that it's difficult to deal with this. I know my nature is to be vengeful, to take revenge, and to even do it in a greater measure. You know, the Romans actually had a god of revenge or retribution, uh, the goddess Invidia. I mean, think about it. Revenge was a god they worshipped. And I think we live in a culture that worship, worships revenge. You know, I have to ask myself, do I worship revenge? You know, I've told you guys the story before of the road rage incident I had when I lived in Riverside, California. I was on my way to see some brothers and some people thought I had cut them off and they chased me down and, and trapped me in a restaurant parking lot, blocked me in and when I got out of my car to apologize, four people bum rushed me. And so I, I ran into the restaurant just to be in safety or if they were going to harm me, they were going to do it with witnesses. And of course, they didn't follow me in. And when I looked back out the window, they were slashing my tires. You know, I called the brothers who uh, I was about to go meet, told them what happened. They came and picked me up. And by the time they got there, my initial rush of fear had settled and I was filled with anger and I wanted revenge. I told him, guys, I've got some baseball bats in my trunk. I know what the car looked like. Let's go find them. Let's go see how tough they are when it's not four on one or five on one. I don't remember, four or five of them. And um, brothers had to calm me down and, and redirect me back to the heart of Jesus. That's who I am in my nature. And granted, that's an extreme situation that I speak of there. But what about the more subtle ways we aim to get back at people? in our normal day-to-day? -day? Do we avoid people, give them the silent treatment or push people away? You know, maybe it's trading insult for insult that escalates an argument with a spouse or with a child or with your parent children. You know, maybe someone at work makes things difficult on you, so hmm, I'm gonna make things difficult on them. You know, none of these things are, are like Jesus. These responses are nothing like him. Remember how this whole section is framed. Chapter 2, verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. You know, in this section we focused on this morning in 1 Peter 3, verse 11, tells us that we... We're to reject evil, pursue good. We're told to seek peace and pursue it. Why? You know, let's reread verse 12 of chapter 3. We're told, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Brothers and sisters, the eyes of the Lord are on us. We are his chosen people, and we are called to follow the example of his son Jesus, our Lord. His ears are attentive, we're told, to those who strive to live this way. 
but are against those who instead conform to the evil ways of the world. As we close things out this morning and prepare to take the Lord's Supper, now I want to encourage us as we head into our week, just like we did last week, let's ask ourselves the question, in light of the example of Jesus, what, if anything, needs to change in my interactions with my brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, as we conclude this study this morning, where the Holy Spirit has focused on us representing Jesus in our interactions with people, we're going to see the author bring our focus right back to Jesus in chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. So we're going to end with those verses today before taking the Lord's Supper, because fixing our eyes on Jesus is the key to living in the way of the cross. Let's go ahead and read chapter 3, 15 and 18. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it's God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit refocuses us on, on Jesus here after these instructions, saying, revere Christ as Lord. I mean, we're told that only in Him could the original recipients have hope while facing the trying times that they were facing, they had to keep their eyes on him. And only through him can we have hope when facing trying times. We must keep our eyes focused on him. He suffered for our sins, we're told here, the righteous for the unrighteous. And why? To bring us to God. You know, at times following Christ is Difficult, just like it was for the original recipients of this letter. But what may we never forget the privilege that it is to be brought back to the shepherd and overseer of our souls by Jesus giving his life on the cross for us. Mm -hmm.